Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, this is a large collaboration work across five institutes. Unfortunately, the first author won't be able to be here because he's still under visa check. Okay. Supercomputers are known for their massive compute power and parallelism. But such power and skill cannot really serve people unless they process or generate data by doing I.O. But at the same time, I.O. speed has been falling behind that of computation. This figure here shows the relative I.O. speed versus computation speed of the top one supercomputers of the world over the years. And you can see the bandwidth relative to flops has been falling down. Part of the reason is the enlarging performance gap between the processing units and the secondary storage. And also, supercomputer I.O. has very deep and distributed I.O. stacks, all the way from applications through several levels of I.O. middleware before we reach parallel file system and storage hardware. And finally, unlike CPUs or main memory, which are dedicated to one application at a time, parallel I.O. resources are shared system-wide, making I.O. operations less scalable or less consistent. Therefore, most application users consider I.O. both expensive and not predictable. Therefore, they often control the total I.O. volume by limiting their total I.O. time under a certain limit, say 5% of their job's total execution time. Meanwhile, most of the time, the I.O. subsystem is actually not that busy. So this figure shows the last year backend utilization level of two leading computers, Titan at Oak Ridge National Lab and the Taihu Light at the Wuxi Supercomputing Center in China. We counted the average load level of these last year OSDs, object storage targets, and uh, counting the percentage of time that they reach a certain bandwidth level relative to their maximum throughput. You can see from this, actually, on both systems, at least 60% of the time, we see under 1% utilization of their peak bandwidth. And at least 70% of the time, it's under 5% utilization. So somehow, supercomputer I.O. manages to be a performance bottleneck, a contention point, and is seeing severe underutilization all at the same time. In this work, we develop a tool to understand what the hell is going on. So we built Beacon, a, the first end-to-end -end I.O. monitoring system for supercomputers to our best knowledge. It performs lightweight end-to-end I.O. resource monitoring. It collects per application level traces and statics, statistics and correlates these data together to form a full picture from the applications and system's point of view. It facilitates effective performance diagnosis, application I.O. profiling, and performs automatic anomaly detection. Beacon has been deployed on Taihu Light, currently the world's third largest supercomputer, for production use since April 2017. It requires no user effort and it does not require any application change. Since its deployment, it has identified several hidden problems in the I.O. system's design, configuration, or policy setting. Most of these problems have been fixed since. Both its code and the part of the monitoring data we have collected have been released. Okay. First, we'd like to give an uh, overview of the Taihu Light architecture our deployment uh, platform. So here we have uh, super nodes formed by 256 nodes, four of which will form a cabinet, and there are a total of 40 such cabinets. Together, this makes 40,000 compute nodes with more than 10 million cores combined. Okay. In the middle, we have the 288 I.O. forwarding nodes connecting the front end and the back end via two separate high-speed infinite band networks. And then on the right, we have another 288 storage nodes, 
a pair of these nodes will be connected to a group of six luster back backend OSTs, okay, um, on 60 disk, disk arrays. So on the computer nodes, we run the LWFS client, the client of a lightweight user space file system built on top of Gluster. In, on the forwarding node, we run the LWFS client uh, server and the Luster client. And the, on the storage nodes, we run the Luster servers. In addition, there are two metadata servers. And this storage and I.O. infrastructure also serves another smaller cluster, mainly for pre-processing and post-processing visualization. Finally, users access these machines from logging nodes connected with a dedicated Ethernet network for monitoring and management. Okay. Now we show the working of the beacon system. It places demons at different monitoring points of the system. So on the computer nodes, we watch the LWFS client by performing full operation uh, tracing. And on the forwarding nodes, we watch both the LWFS server and the Luster client uh, by performing both profiling, where we can get statistics for a batch of I.O. operations and sampled monitoring, where we sample certain status at a certain amount of uh, time interval, for example, to get read-write distribution or average queue length. On the storage node and metadata servers, we do similar profiling and uh, time-based sampling. All these amount to about 100 gigabytes of raw, raw data every day. And uh, the, here, the different size of the arrows indicate front-end uh, uh, online compression, where we reduce the data by over order of magnitude. And then these compressed data are passed to a distributed I.O. Rec record database, piggybacked on a group of 85 storage nodes, because these nodes typically have very little computation load. Okay. So the data are first collected through Logstash and then fed into a distributed database built on Elasticsearch, with the data store Redis sitting in between as an in-memory cache. One of these nodes will support a job database by interacting with the batch job scheduler. Finally, these monitoring data are periodically passed to a dedicated beacon server, where, where again, we have a similar software stack. But on the top of the stack here, we have web services providing query and visualization services to sysadmins and users. And also, we perform another round of data compression here. So here we show uh, what the data collection will look like. For example, at the LWFS client, we have data entries that look like this. This also explains why the data compression works so well, because with tightly coupled parallel applications, we do have a lot of data redundancy to be squeezed out. Due to time limits, I won't be able to get into the full detail. If you are interested, please feel free to check our online uh, data set. Okay. And then these monitoring data are periodically passed to the dedicated I.O. server for long-term uh, storage, where it undergoes several rounds of processing. To do per job I.O. performance analysis, we have to first find the strings that connect the scattered beats belonging to the same job. And that is done by several levels of mapping. For example, from the batch job scheduler, we can find out which compute nodes are act allocated to a certain job. And then, again, by looking up our database, we'll find the actual compute to forwarding node mapping at that time. And finally, with Luster file system lookup, we'll be able to find the mapping between forwarding nodes and backend nodes to link their records together. The system admins sees beyond individual jobs and applications. They have access to a much richer service, a set of services for query and visualization, and they are able to check the status of any node at any time. And finally, Beacon performs automatic anomaly detection. Okay. So here we show a brief demo of what's going on. 
So first, oops. First, for the users, they can check the job his I/O history of their uh, applications. For this job, for example, we can see the bandwidth and the metadata operation count for that job. And for the system admins, we can look at a lot of different things. For example, we can check at a certain time what happens to a group of OSTs or individual OSTs. We can look at bandwidth and then the distribution of different operations. In this case, the distribution between read and write. So for the rest of the talk, we'll mainly be focusing on case studies of Beacon, starting with application I.O. behavior analysis. This is based on our 18 months of collected data from Taihu Light, and we choose to focus on jobs that use 32 computer nodes or more, and there are over 116,000 of, of them. So before we get to the results, first we introduce the common I.O. No, uh, modes. With one-to-one -one I.O. mode, basically we are performing sequential I.O. Only one compute node of the job is performing I.O. to one single file. With end-to-one, all compute nodes are accessing one shared file. With end-to-one I.O. mode, each compute node accesses its own private file. And finally, with end-to-M, we have I.O. aggregation with a subset of M compute nodes acting as aggregators, performing parallel I.O. to M files. Okay, this is what we see from the I.O. history of those jobs. And immediately, we can see several problems. First, despite all these parallel I.O. infrastructure, a large portion of file read and write is still done with sequential I.O. And second, the notorious n one I.O. mode, which is very slow, is still used by a substantial amount of applications. And finally, the highly in encouraged N2M mode is rarely adopted. To change the status, we propose to perform more direct communication with application users because with Beacon provided insight, we can direct contact users, especially owners of large-scale I.O. intensive applications. For example, the 2017 a ACM Golden Bell Prize winner, AW P code switched from its N2M to one mode to N2M to and saved a lot of IO time. The second case shows how cross layer IO volume comparison helps identify an obscure performance problem. Like many supercomputers, Taihu Light adopts IO forwarding. One of its main benefits is that it provides another layer of caching and prefetching. The left figure shows the expected behavior, where we have read from the compute node layer and the forwarding layer for a sample of 70 hour period of time. And this is what we see with caching on the forwarding node. The forwarding nodes will read much less from the back end than the compute nodes reading from them. And on the right, we have another sample of 70 hour period, which shows the opposite behavior. So this is how much the compute nodes will be reading. And on these visible I.O. bursts, the forwarding node will actually read a lot more than what the compute nodes request. A closer look reveals that this is due to cache thrashing at the forwarding nodes. Because of Luster's aggressive setting, each thread will prefetch 40 megabytes when doing sequential read. And when the application happens to be using the end-to-end I.O. mode, the threads will be kicking out data prefetched by their peers. So we have to solve this by reducing such self-contention. This could be done by deploying a per-file prefetching limit. And also, it will help, again, if the user switches from end-to-end mode to the more encouraged end-to-end mode. The third example shows the forwarding node utilization. Here we have two samples of one day utilization of forwarding nodes, both from July 2017. We have the rows showing 40 randomly sampled forwarding nodes, the same for the two pictures. And then columns show the 24 hours. 
each cell is color coded to show how busy that uh, forwarding node is during that hour based on the peak load we have observed relative to the forwarding node maximum bandwidth. For example here, high implies over 90% utilization and then low means the peak we saw is under 10%. So from this we can see that the forwarding node resource clearly is over provisioned. Most of the time the forwarding nodes are underutilized. But still there are IO bursts during which groups of 40 nodes are overwhelmed. And regardless of the load level, there is a clear load imbalance between the different 40 nodes. This is due to the fixed mapping strategy between the compute nodes and 40 nodes, oblivious to application needs. So this finding has motivated us to propose DFRA, dynamic forwarding resource allocation. Actually, our paper Describing this scheme is to be presented right next door in about one hour. So you are encouraged to attend if you are interested. And then um, for the next case study, we can see another hidden problem with MDS request priority setting. Here, we have found that applications that are metadata intensive tend to cause heavy performance interference, even when the application sharing a forwarding node with it has very little metadata access activity. From the left, we have the bandwidth heavy application lamps. And on the right, we have the metadata heavy DNDC. This shows the, uh, their solo runs timeline. And then when they are put together to share the same forwarding node, we can see lamps suffers great performance slowdown. And this turns out to be due to that. The forwarding nodes are set to give metadata accesses pure priority for better user experience. And to solve that, currently we deployed a probabilistic request processing. Simply by a 50-50 split, we can cut that slowdown to lamps by half while introducing only a small hit on DNDC. Our future work is on developing better scheduling strategies that are considering both fairness and application demands. Okay. So I'm going to uh, skip the final case study and showcase our performance uh, overhead. So we first measured I.O. intensive applications overall execution time without and with beacon turned on and measured the slowdown. Overall, the slowdown is very small, less than 1% of the total execution time. And that overhead doesn't grow when the jobs become larger. And regarding resource consumption, here we list the CPU and memory space utilization on the several types of nodes running the Beacon framework. Again, the overhead is negligible. For the dedicated IO ser uh, beacon server, our major concern is the storage space consumption. And here, after two rounds of data compression, for the past 18 months, the total monitoring data da uh, amounts to about 10 terabytes. With a 112, 120 terabyte disk array, that server can last well past the machine's lifetime. Okay? So before conclusion, one word about generality. Although our discussion has been focused on one single supercomputer, the overall idea of Beacon can be applied to many other machines. Its building blocks, such as log data collection and compression, multi-level data correlation and profiling, and online anomaly detection are all general purpose and not specific to any machine design. Also, its implementation has been leveraging popular open source software, for example, Logstash, Redis, MySQL. To conclude, the major takeaway from this work is that it's absolutely affordable and rewarding to enable detailed end-to-end -end IO monitoring on large platforms like the supercomputers. It helps us to understand sources of inefficiency and exposes hidden flaws in design and configuration. And finally, it facilitates better I.O. practice at these machines. Note that messages like 
N21 is bad, N2M is good, has been around in papers, IO-related tutorials, user guides for a long time. But systems like Beacon will allow us to understand what users are actually doing and have direct communication with them to either promote better practice or design policy changes that can ident uh, isolate troublemakers, to isolate them from potential victims. And again, our software and uh, part of the monitoring data set are released here. You are welcome to check them out. Thank you. Thanks, Xiao Song. All right, questions? I'll ask one just to start things off. So, uh, very nice work. So, from some of these lessons, have you been able to share them with your users at the supercomputer? You mentioned something briefly. Definitely, definitely. So, what's your experience been there? Has it led to real improvements? In yes, for many of them, it has led to that. Because for many of these super application, uh, supercomputer applications, they care about computation performance. And when you go for Gordon Bell computation, for example, all they care is flops. But many of these applications actually spend a lot of time on I.O., which is not counted for those competitions. But if you can manage to save a great chunk from their execution, it makes their work more productive and also saves the center a lot of energy and uh, resources, I.O. So cycles. Thank you. So uh, just a related follow-up. Um, I don't know what the charging model or pricing model here mm -hmm. is or if these are all in-house users, but how does this impact their cost? Is there a very good incentive for them to uh, take on the lessons that you have learned? Or? Hopefully in the future, because one motivation for doing this is that we might be thinking of, for example, if some users stay with very poor I.O. practice that not only hurt their own performance, but interfere with others' resource usage, we may imply certain kind of uh, penalty in terms of charging, et cetera. Sounds yeah. great, thanks. Any other yeah. questions? Hi, uh, my name is Wan So. I'm from Sonos. Uh, quick question on that uh, categorization of like one to M, one to M to N, yes. N to M parents. So, mm -hmm. is it including read and write? Does yep. not both read and write. Wouldn't and it be worth it actually uh, separating read and write so that uh, factoring that reads can be done in parallel and then write actually has to be exclusive? Mm, actually, both is better to be done in parallel. Many of these HPC applications are read once and then write in many episodes, not necessarily, not rewriting their data, but they read their input file and then do time step simulation. Once a certain number of time steps, they will have to write the intermediate results. That's how you see, for example, how the weather forecast uh, applications have these uh, movement of cloud. And both of them, the, uh, the efficiency will be much higher if they can be effectively parallelized. The problem with N21 write, for example, is that log synchronization will cause so much trouble, especially at large scale, that you end up writing very, very slowly. Okay, you just mentioned the log means that it's exclusive, right? I've got confused now, so. Yeah, if yeah. you write all the compute nodes right to the same file, then you, they have to coordinate logs. That's why yeah. I think that it may be worth like kind of distinguishing read and write, but I, we can take it off. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, there's one more. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Chad Schneider Hi. from NetApp. Um, sounds like you've deployed this on a supercomputer. Yes. Could this be utilized on a SAN or NAS appliance as well? I think so, although the scenarios will be different, but the overall software structure and the, uh, the, the general practice of online processing, anomaly detection, et cetera, I believe it's common. Thanks. Mm. All right, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Shaw Song again. Okay. Thank you.